90% of my Dota games are on the mid role. Having reached top 300 while mainly playing mid, I decided to create a guide to help other aspiring main characters. To become a skilled mid player, the first and foremost thing you need is a hero pool. It's important to keep your hero pool limited, ideally with around 3 to 5 heroes at max. The reason behind this is that the more heroes you try to play, the more time you will spend learning these heroes rather than learning the game itself. It's essential to understand the mechanics and strategies of the mid role before trying to master different heroes. When I say learning the game, I mean that you should know how to play the mid role effectively, as this will be the foundation of your success. Once you have mastered the basics, learning new heroes will be much easier as your game sense will be at a higher level. You can choose whichever heroes you like, but if you're just starting out, I would recommend playing heroes with a lower mechanical skill ceiling. Heroes like Zeus, Kunkka, and Death Prophet are one of those heroes that cannot get stomped in the lane even if you're starting out. If you're someone who has experience playing in the mid lane, you can choose whatever you like. However, I would recommend having at least two heroes that are mobile and have catch. Heroes such as the Spirits or Puck or Tiny are good examples. Other than that, depending upon your playstyle, you can also integrate greedy mid heroes. Greedy mid heroes are generally carries from the mid lane. Heroes such as TA, Morphling, Sniper and Shadow Fiend are a few examples. I will go more into the type of mid heroes in the next section, where you can have a better idea of what is required in specific scenarios. Learning new heroes when you have a deeper game sense will be easier, so make it simple and effective for yourself by focusing on a limited hero pool, mastering the, the mid role, and then gradually expanding your hero pool. When it comes to drafting your hero in a pub, you will have almost all the information required to pick the right hero except for your lane matchup in most cases. This is because the mid laner usually has the last pick and can see 4 out of the 5 enemy heroes. Most heroes in Dota can be played in the mid lane because of how the lane has evolved over the years. In order to know what is the right hero to pick in any given scenario, consider the following things. There are various types of mid heroes. Keeping it broad, we will categorize them into 5 categories. I will explain them briefly because if we go through all the heroes, one video won't be enough. But don't worry, this is just to build your intuition for what heroes are good in what scenarios. Category 1. Space Creators These are heroes that are mobile and have innate abilities that allow them to be elusive and catch heroes. Space Creators can be picked in any game and be useful. These heroes generally don't require a big item before they can have an impact and have the ability to split push in dangerous areas that allow them to create space for their team or carry and if played superbly can snowball and solo carry games as well. Examples of such heroes are the Spirits, Puck, Tiny, Pango, Quaswex Invoker, etc. Category 2 Greedy Heroes These heroes are essentially carries from the mid lane. These heroes are the opposites of the space creators. They eat space, aren't mobile, have no reliable catch, and eat items before they can be useful. Generally, these heroes are also known as griefers in Dota. Examples of such heroes are TA, Morphling, Shadowfiend, Sniper, Quas Exode Invoker, etc. These heroes generally require you to be very good at laning because if these heroes lose their lane, the game is already over in most cases as you and your carry will fight for space while having no map. Category number 3, mix of both. These are certain heroes that have some form of catch and can also be greedy. These heroes generally can have an impact without items, but if they play greedy, they can have immense impact. Examples of such heroes are Leshrac and Kunkka. Both these heroes can have catch and good farming capabilities. They can essentially become the carry from the mid lane if required. Category number 4, Lane Dominators. These heroes are very strong laners. They have a small number of bad matchups and counter most of the other heroes in lane. While these heroes might be good in lane, it is easy to shut them down post laning phase unless they absolutely dumpster the lane. The reason why these heroes are strong laners is because they will always out region you and in some cases won't even allow you to lane. Example of such heroes are SF, Queen of Pain, Bat Rider, Death Prophet, Wiper, Necrophos, etc. Notice how most of these heroes are squishy if they get caught and don't really have a reliable low cooldown catch. Category number 5 Cheese Picks These are heroes that can only work in a very specific scenario. 
cheese heroes are mostly heroes with summons. In order for these heroes to excel, they need a perfect draft. Basically, these heroes have a lot of counters, but in some games, they have absolutely no counter, hence they are known as cheese picks. They excel at mid because you always get to see all of the draft before you pick your hero. While these heroes are cheese heroes, some players that have thousands of games on these heroes are able to have an impact on these heroes even in bad scenarios. Example of such heroes are Visage, Meepo, Husker, Tinker, Brood, Lone Druid, etc. These heroes have a high skill ceiling and take time to master. Category number 6, Building Destroyers. These are heroes that are equipped with ways to do tons of building damage. They either have spells that do tower damage or they buy items that do tower damage. You wanna know what wins Dota? Taking objectives. Examples of such heroes are Pugna, Lashrak, Death Prophet, TA, Dragon Knight, etc. These heroes generally don't have a catch and are very easy to catch with the exception of DK. Category number 7. Magical Burst. The last category we will be going over are heroes that are equipped with insane amounts of magical damage. Yes, I know Pug does a gazillion magic damage, but these are mainly heroes that lack catch, but if you need burst damage? These heroes are omega cringe, but do the job. Examples of such heroes are Zeus, Coral, and Pugna. When it comes to drafting your hero, the most traditional view is since mid gets last pick, you either want to counter their mid laner if you can, or you want to pick something to round your draft off. That is, whatever your draft lacks and what counters the enemy carry because you want to make his life miserable. Let's go over different scenarios to have a better understanding of when to go for which hero. Assuming your team has tower damage but lacks catch and requires a hero that has mobility to rotate efficiently, then you should go for category A, the space creators. Assuming your team does not have tower damage either and then you need a hero that can fulfill all of the above. Most building takers aren't mobile or don't have a catch except for one, that is Dragon Knight. If your team has decent catch and your carry is a non-greedy hero that doesn't require that much farm to participate in fights like Riki, Faceless Void, Ursa, then you can go for a greedy mid hero. You essentially switch between farming with these heroes as they can fight with minimal items like Defusal, Mask of Madness, etc. You shouldn't pick a greedy mid hero if you have a carry that requires space, unless you're a psychopath like me who picks TA regardless of the situation. Uh, I'm just kidding. If your team requires some form of catch and illusion clear but not necessarily a hero that needs to create space, heroes in the mix category can be useful. These heroes can scale well into the late game and become very strong. These heroes can act as space creators as well, but they need some item before they can do that. Like a BKB for Kunkai is an example. If you're one of those players that always want to win their lane, going for lane dominators is the right choice. But do keep in mind, you can grief your team by picking these heroes if your team requires a hero from the space creator category. From my experience, lane dominators and counter picking does get you a lot of MMR in pubs. But it's a bad practice in the long run because there will be a time it won't work and you will get stuck at some point. Cheese picks, probably the most hated category by the majority of Dota players. As explained before, cheese picks are only good if it's an absolutely free game and you can pull it off. It has a high skill ceiling. The only way to know if it's an absolutely free game is if you are a cheese hero enjoyer. I wouldn't recommend new players to start off by learning this category. Cheese picks can also be used to replace building takers, but only if it's, if it's not an atrocious game for the hero. If your team has catch, magical damage, strong lanes, but lacks tower damage, then you should opt for the category 6, the building destroyers. In most cases, if your team lacks tower damage, it doesn't matter how hard you're owning the game, the enemy gets enough time to come back into the game and roll over you, so as the last pick of your team, it's your job to fill that criteria. Let's assume your team has all the catch it needs, right? It has heroes that can go and start fights for you and become shields for you essentially. Given that the enemy doesn't have gap close, picking a hero like Zeus with insane damage is insanely good as you'll essentially turn into a cheese pick and dish out insane amounts of damage. Honestly, Zeus is a menace if you can't do anything about him. Lastly, it is important to remember that while drafting is important in Dota, it's not the only factor that determines a game's outcome. Don't worry too much about drafting the perfect hero. Instead, Focus on playing heroes you're comfortable with and have experience playing. Even if you have a disadvantageous matchup, you can still outskill your opponent and turn the game around.
Stop! Check your average net worth at 10 minute mark from the last 5 games that you played mid. If your net worth is less than 3.5k, then you need to focus on this part of the guide, as this will be the key to your success. 60% of the mid roll is the laning phase. If you can manage to consistently do well in your laning phase, you will win more than you will lose. Mid lane is the most mechanical lane out of all the lanes as it's a 1 vs 1. You cannot blame your supports or anything else if you fuck up, so focus on this part of the section. If your early game is subpar, you won't be able to maximize your impact in the rest of the game. In order to become a good laner, you need to have the correct lane approach and be good at your lane mechanics. After the drafting phase, it's crucial to move on to the strategy phase and take a moment to think about your lane matchup. To determine your lane opponent, you should utilize the categories we discussed before and figure out who could potentially be the enemy mid laner. In most cases, it's their last pick. Once you've identified your lane matchup, the next step is determining which side has the advantage. To do this, you should evaluate your hero's strengths and weaknesses, as well as those of your opponents. For instance, let's say you're playing as Ember Spirit. His vulnerability in lane is that he's a melee hero and if he's against a hero that out damages him greatly, then he suffers. If you're facing a hero like Huskar or SF who have high amounts of damage that breaks your shield and doesn't let you go near the wave, then this is considered as an unfavorable matchup. On the other hand, if you're up against a hero like Puck, who you can out damage with your constant spam of Slide of Fist, and Puck having no way of forcing you out of the lane pre level 6, this is considered as a favorable matchup. Based on your assessment of the lane matchup, you should adjust your playing style accordingly. If it's an easy matchup, you should take the front foot and play aggressively. Conversely, if it's a difficult matchup, you should adopt a more defensive approach, playing on the back foot and trying to get whatever you can out of the lane. When you're in difficult matchups, have the mindset that you cannot win this lane, so you need to focus on not losing this lane, which basically means get whatever you can out of the lane without dying. Focus more on farming rather than fighting so you can recover after the laning phase. Since it's a 1 vs 1 on the mid lane, the matchups are more complex. To have a better idea of matchups, you can join Dota 2 Pro Tracker's Discord server and search for your lane matchup and watch how pros are playing said matchups. This will help you do better. When it comes to lane itemization, there are a few things you need to keep in mind. Your starting items should be such that you should get bottled before minute 2 every game. Provided you aren't a Monkey King or Necrophos or Invoker, basically heroes that don't buy bottle. On melee heroes, this means Quelling Blade, 2x Branch, Fairy, Tango. On range heroes, you can go either 4x Branch, Fairy Tango, or 3x Branch, Fairy Tango. The reason you want your bottle before minute 2 is because of the water runes. It's free region, and in the mid lane, if you don't buy a bottle and your opponent does, you will lose your lane just based on that. The only time you can skip bottles is if you're playing against Batrider. Against this hero, you should buy Magic Wand, Branch, and Fairy Fire, and after runes, ship out a set of Tangos from your courier. And after that, you mostly want to rush Brown Boots so you don't feed the Batrider. Pretty straightforward, right? There's no gimmick, it actually is that simple. After you're done buying your items in the strategy phase, the next thing you want to do is walk towards the mid river as soon as you get into the game from the strategy phase. This is very crucial as every second matters and the more you delay it, the less chances of this to work. Once you reach the mid river, I want you to walk towards the enemy mid tier 1, just at the edge of the enemy tower attack range. The reason behind this is we're checking whether the enemy has vision on their high ground or not. At night time, the tower can see you on the edge of its attack range without external vision, that is, from an ally hero or a ward. If the tower doesn't attack you at the edge, that means the enemy does not have vision on you. You can place a ward on the enemy high ground without them knowing. The reason behind doing this is the enemy supports will usually try to do the same thing trying to scout your ward on your own high ground. If you plant the ward on your own high ground, they will always deward it. But if it is on their own high ground without them knowing, the chances of your ward getting dewarded are very low. On the other hand, if the tower does hit you, it basically means that the enemy can see you so you shouldn't place your ward. Instead, just go back towards your block and plant the ward when you reach the mid river while blocking after the creeps spawn. 
These are the best possible ways to ward. Another thing to keep in mind is you always want to ward in a way that shows where the any supports will rotate from. Usually this is going to be their position 4 and the rotation will mostly come from the enemy offlane side. So always ward towards your own safe lane. Moving on to lane mechanics. The first mechanic we will be going over is blocking. Before we go over blocking, the thing I want to clarify is whether you should stay for bounties or go back and block. It is generally fine to fight for bounties if your hero has a really strong level 1 spell. Heroes such as Leshrac with his AoE stun, SF with raises, or if your team is making a coordinated play that is smoking through the enemy, etc. However, if you want to keep it simple, 50 gold won't make that big of a difference so it's very unlikely that you staying AFK to block will change the outcome of the game drastically. Usually, it isn't worth it to sacrifice your block for bounty rune especially in matchups that are very one-sided. Because if the wave ends up on the enemy high ground and you're in an advantageous matchup, you won't be able to pressure the enemy enough as they can just aggro the creeps constantly in their tower. And if it's a disadvantageous matchup, you will get zoned out as the enemy will have high ground advantage. We will go over this more later on. In even matchups, especially melee versus melee, the block doesn't matter as much with the exception of monkey king versus melee heroes. Now, moving on to how to actually block. The first thing you need is your positioning. As Radiant, you just stand here and move like this. And as Dire, you stand here and move like this. The second thing to make sure of is your camera is following your hero rather than having to drag it. In order to make sure your camera is following your hero, either double click on your hero portrait or set a bind in the console. I su highly suggest the latter as it makes blocking easy. The command is Dota underscore camera underscore center. In order to bind it to a specific key, for example, I want to use it on caps lock, so I will type bind caps lock Dota underscore camera underscore center in the console. You can put any key in place of this and then you just have to press it and your camera will follow your hero. This can come in handy in all parts of the game. Once that is done, in order to block perfectly, keep playing left and right quickly while pressing the stop key as much as you can. Practice this in a custom lobby a lot and you'll eventually get the hang of it with practice. Lastly, a lot of people are confused about how much do you have to actually block. The ideal place to have your wave meet the enemy wave is your own high ground, just outside of the tower range. In some cases, you will block so much that the enemy creep wave will enter your tower range. In order to avoid that, keep looking at your minimap while blocking as soon as you see the enemy creeps on the tier 1. You will have an idea of whether they will enter your tower range or not. If the answer is yes, stop blocking, stand outside your tower range and tank the enemy creep wave until your creeps aggro on them. This is basically the most ideal placement you can achieve from blocking. The second thing we will be going over in the lane mechanics is high ground advantage. Since creep equilibrium doesn't work in the mid lane the same way as it would in the side lanes because the mid lane is a really small lane in comparison, we will talk about the high ground advantage instead. Don't get me wrong, creep equilibrium is still useful in the mid lane but not as useful as it would be in the side lanes. Having the creeps on your high ground that is around the ramp area is always going to be advantageous for you because of several reasons. Number one is being able to trade better. If the enemy trades from the low ground, they will miss 25% of their attacks. Not only that, you will also have your tower's aura that will provide you with additional armor and HP regen. Number two is being able to zone out the enemy by forcing them into an uncomfortable position. When your enemy is going to be in the river trying to aggro the creeps towards himself or trying to secure last hits, imagine you're playing SF. Wouldn't you just start raising him? If the enemy comes close, they will take a lot of damage. If they don't, they will lose a lot of creeps. It's a win-win situation. Number 3 is being able to lane unfavorable matchups. If you're in an unfavorable matchup, let's say Ember vs SF, if the waves end up at your high ground after the block, you can just like aggro the wave inside your tower and get decent XP and gold because this SF won't be able to raise you or zone you out inside your tower. This way, you'll be able to get to level 2 before the enemy and have an advantage. In order to enhance your laning phase to the next level, you need to polish your last hitting and creep aggro. Let's start off with last hitting. I would advise everyone to practice this. Even pros practice last hitting on a daily basis. Because trust me, the number of times I've seen players missing free CS, including myself, is surreal. In order to get better last hitting, 
there are two ways. One is to use the in-game Elastic Trainer, which can be found in the Learn tab. And the other is to go to the arcade section and search for a game called Trailing Polygon. Inside Training Polygon, you can find the Last Hit Trainer. Personally, I preferred the Last Hit Trainer in the Training Polygon one, as you're actually practicing against a bot with a decent reaction time. Assuming you are interested in improving because you're actually spending time watching this guide, I would recommend doing either for 10 minutes a day before you start playing. It's a decent warm up and it makes you better at the game. So why not? Creep aggro refers to the behavior of neutral creeps and lame creeps when they are provoked to attack a hero or unit. Keep aggroing occurs when a player commands their hero to attack an enemy hero or a creep that is within 500 range of the enemy creeps. This has a cooldown of 3 seconds. When a player issues an attack command on an enemy hero, the nearby enemy creeps will switch their focus to attack the hero who attacked their ally. This is called creep aggroing. These are some creep aggro tips that you can use to manipulate creep waves to your advantage. Number 1. Always aggro the enemy wave towards yourself if it's on the enemy high ground. This will make the wave come to the low ground while you will have an easier time last hitting without missing any hits or being in an uncomfortable position. Number 2. Whenever an enemy creep is in last hit range, Aggro the creep towards yourself because it will mess up the attack timing of the enemy and will make it easier for you to secure the last hit. Number 3. The way people secure last hits is by timing their attack perfectly with the attacks of their creeps. For example, if enemy creeps are attacking your range creep, the enemy mid hero will time his projectile or melee attack in a way that it secures the last hits for him. You can aggro the enemy melee creeps off of your range creep in a way that ruins the timing of the enemy hero. Basically. If the enemy here is trying to time it like this and then you aggro, then you can just like deny it at the right time. Another good example is this, right? So these creeps are hitting my melee creep. Such in a way that if I aggro right now and this guy hits, he will miss it and then I can just deny it. So you can use aggro in this way. You can also do this for spells. For example, if I aggro these creeps here on my range creep, Storm is going to use his remnant in a way and then I will just do this and it will be left at 1 HP. Number 4. If the enemy mid laner is gone to take bounty rune or for any other reason, try to aggro the enemy melee creeps onto your range creep. This will result in your range creep dying quickly and the enemy mid laner will miss out on that XP. These are just examples that will open your brain to more scenarios. Number 5. If you are in a lane matchup in which you are getting outrange, like versus a sniper or silencer etc, you can manipulate the creep wave by aggroing it continuously towards yourself making it so you can have an easier time last hitting and also forcing the squishy position based hero in a bad position which can open up opportunities to kill them. Number 6. You can use aggro to find out whether the enemy mid laner has a ward or not. If you aggro the creeps and run to your high ground and the creeps keep following you given that the enemy hero is not giving them your high ground vision then it means the enemy has a lane ward. If they don't have a lane ward the creeps will stop chasing you as soon as they lose vision of you. This will also keep them from being aggro to your high ground which can be annoying because you want to be in a safer position. In order to aggro the enemy creeps when the enemy doesn't have vision on your high ground, strand right next to your range creep and then aggro them. They will follow you. This is because your range creep gives them vision while the range creep is attacking. I'll give you an example. So if I aggro right now, the creeps will stop chasing me because they, don't, they lose vision of me, right? But let's say if I stand right next to my range creep and then I aggro, the creeps will keep following me because they have vision on, on me because of the range creep, because the range creep is attacking. This is how you can aggro when the enemy doesn't have vision on your high ground. Number 7. The last advice when it comes to aggroing is that you always want to aggro the waves in a way that you gain some form of advantage by doing that. The next thing we will be going over is wave dragging slash manipulation. While we haven't gone over creep equilibrium, if you can, then it is generally better to hold the enemy creeps outside of your tower range rather than dragging them inside your tower. This allows you to make the waves meet at your high ground, which has its own advantages as discussed before. If you kill the enemy mid laner or he's not present for some reason and a creep wave is approaching, you can walk to the enemy high ground or behind their tower and drag the creep wave away from the lane such that it doesn't meet your own creep wave. This will make your own creep wave enter the enemy tower. Since the enemy mid laner is dead, he will lose out on a lot of XP because the tower kills the creeps really fast. Another example of this is that if you are playing a hero that can reliably push in waves quickly like SF with raises for example, and the enemy is dead, you can use raises to clear the enemy wave which allows your creeps to 
push into the enemy tower, resulting in them missing out on XP because the tower kills the creeps really fast. If you're in a really hard matchup, for example Ember vs Husker, chances are Husker won't let you go near the wave. In this case, after you get brown boots, go behind the enemy tier 1 and drag the enemy wave. This is really hard to do, but if you can manage to do it, you can get a lot out of an unplayable lane. The next thing we will be going over is efficient trading. If you want to win all of your lanes, you need to always trade effectively. To do that, here are some tips. Number 1. The first thing you need to keep in mind is the number of creeps on both sides. Whenever you have more creeps, you should force a trade. And similarly, if the enemy has more creeps than you, you should avoid trading. Number 2. You should generally not trade from the low ground as you will miss a bunch of hits and the enemy will have tower protection aura in most cases. However, if you have a decent numbers advantage in terms of creeps, then it is fine to do that. Number 3. When you know that you can't deny a creep, for example the enemy has a spell that will secure the creep no matter what you do, instead of trying to deny that creep, you can hit the enemy hero and make him lose some of his HP for that creep. Number 4. Forcing a trade when you know the enemy doesn't have any backup region left while you do is always beneficial. This will allow you to zone the enemy out or force them to go back to base. Always check the enemy inventory continuously to know how much mana they have left. Number 5. Check the enemy stats to know whether you'll win a right click trade. Some heroes have an insane amount of armor, some have next to zero armor. For example, Puck has a really low armor if she's trading with a hero like TA, she will lose. The next thing we will be covering is spell usage in the laning phase. Most mid laners excel because of their spell usage. Your spell usage can make or break your laning phase. Here are some tips when it comes to using your spells efficiently in the lane. Almost every mid hero has a spell that allows them to secure last hits. The best way to use these spells is when the first wave meets. Start right clicking the enemy range creep and secure it with your spell. This guarantees that the range creep won't get denied and not only that, if the enemy tries to aggro your melee creeps, the melee creeps won't have any creep to de-aggro too because the range creep already died. So the enemy laner will keep tanking them until he aggros them to his melee creeps. Number 2. The most effective way to use your spells in the laning phase is when it leads to you securing creeps while also doing damage to the enemy hero. For example, Leshrag has AoE Lightning. You can use it to secure creeps while simultaneously doing damage to the enemy hero. This is the most ideal way to use your spells. Number 3. Sometimes you can also use your spells to keep the enemy hero away from the wave. Like for example, if you're Shadow Fiend and the enemy hero is nowhere near any creep for you to damage both the hero and secure a creep, you double or triple raise the opponent that will lower their HP and keep them away from the wave. After that, you can deny creeps and secure last hits easily. Number 4. When it comes to laning phase, it isn't necessary to kill the enemy hero 100 to 0. You have to build up your kill by constantly harassing the enemy hero and keeping him below 70% HP. In order to do that, use your spells whenever you feel like the above condition is met. Number 5. Don't use your spells randomly. Always make sure it's effective. For example, if you are playing Puck, using your illusory orb on just the hero isn't effective as it doesn't do that much damage and doesn't get you any last hits. You should always use your spells in a way that they either secure last hits or harass the enemy as well as secure last hits in the laning phase. The last thing we will be going over in the lane mechanics is the HP slash mana management. Most lanes in Dota are won because of region management. Whoever does it better just wins in most cases. Here are some tips that can help you manage your resources better. Number 1. Don't use your bottle charge when you know the enemy can cancel it, similar to how you wouldn't use a salve or clarity to get it cancelled. For example, if you use your bottle charge and ember has light of fist, he can cancel it while doing damage to you. You're setting up ember to have the best possible spell usage. Number 2. Try to backpack your stat items that give you HP and mana before using water rune or bottle charges to achieve maximum efficiency. You can also disassemble items like arcane boot and then put the mana component in the backpack and then use your bottle. And then put it back. Instead of putting it back, just assemble it again by unlocking it. This way, when you use your bottle, you don't have to lose your movement speed by putting it in the backpack like this. Number 3. Don't give the enemy 2 water runes for free. It's fine to miss out on one creep to get water rune. If you give up the water rune, you can get severely punished. Number 4. Ask your supports to refill your bottle by TPing from the base if they die. This might not work in lower brackets, but I hope supports player watching this start doing this because this is going to 10x your mid laner's game. Number 5. 
You shouldn't use all your mana trying to clear waves. For example, War Spirit can just right click creeps t till they are in range for his E to clear them rather than pressing W and E to clear it. Basically, don't use your spell too much to clear waves in the early game as it takes a lot of mana. Number 6. Always make sure you have enough resources before power rune timer. Let's say you have low mana at minute 5 or minute 7, you should push in the wave and run back to base so you can have full mana and HP for the rune skirmish. If you have no resources and you try to commit to a rune, 8 out of 10 times, you won't get the rune and you will die. This video took a lot of effort and I want to keep helping you guys by making quality content. If you are enjoying the video, please make sure to like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm. And also subscribe. Now back to the guide. Moving on to power runes. As a mid laner, if you're not conscious of the importance of power runes, you are setting yourself up for failure. Runes are quite literally steroids for your hero. Not only do they refill your bottle, but a good rune can also turn the game around in an instant. Runes can lead to successful rotations, enhance your farming capabilities, and make you come back in a losing lane. If you're not consistently trying to contest runes, the enemy mid laner will get them for free and they will end up doing the things we've talked about earlier, which will be detrimental to your game. Here are some tips for securing runes. Number 1. Always have more than 70% HP slash mana before the runes spawn. This will give you a chance to fight for the runes and not feed the enemy for free. You will find yourself not being able to contest runes if you are low on HP or mana. Number 2. Try to push in the lane before the rune timer. This will allow you to not miss out on any gold or XP. Not only that, if the wave is pushed into the enemy tower, your opponent will have to decide between going for the runes and missing out on a wave or taking the wave and missing out on the rune. Number 3. If you're playing a hero like Ember Spirit, put your remnant on one rune and walk to the other one. This way, if the RNG isn't on your side, you can just teleport to the other remnant. Similarly, if you're playing a hero like Void Spirit, you should walk with the enemy as you will have your remnant that can pull them, resulting in you getting the rune. Number 4. If you're in a disadvantageous scenario, just walk to the rune opposite to where your opponent is going. Sometimes luck can be on your side and you can get a rune for free. Number 5. Ask your supports to help with runes. They can walk to one side of the rune while you can go to the other. This way, even if you don't get the rune, your support will and the enemy won't be able to take it. Number 6. Not entirely related to runes, but get a ward and sentry before nighttime which starts at minute 5. Having a high ground ward will help you with the runes and see potential ganks. Most of the ganks happen at nighttime due to limited vision. You can also buy double sentries and plant them on both sides of the river. There's a decent chance you'll always find the enemy ward, which will give you a better return on investment. Number 7. Dying for rune is not worth it. If you see the enemy having a significant advantage that is being higher level than you, having spells to stop you or their sports are ready to punish you, then you should give up on taking the rune. Lastly, power runes aren't just for the laning phase. You should be present at literally every power rune timer. You will see pros contesting or just being there at every single rune timer. That's how important power runes are. Moving on to how to rotate as a mid laner. I've already made a video on this on my channel that will appear on the top right and also linked in the description. I'll be adding an additional tip when it comes to rotating to your own safe lane rather than the enemy safe lane, which wasn't mentioned in that video. In most cases, it's, it is a grief to rotate to your own safe lane, as opposed to pressuring the enemy safe lane because it doesn't lead to any towers when you rotate to your own safe lane. Whereas, if you rotate to the enemy safe lane, you can push out their carry and open up the top lane for your team. The only time you should be rotating to your own safe lane is when you know you can kill the enemy offlaner. For example, if you're playing against a Beastmaster and you're a hero like Coddle or Puck or some spirit that has damage and catch, if you kill the Beastmaster when he's trying to pressure your safe lane tier 1, not only will it save your tower for an additional minute or two, it will also delay Beastmaster's game by a minute or two which is really crucial. Beastmaster is a hero that requires a Dominator 2 before he can have a significant impact. If his timing gets ruined by even a minute, he will be forced to take the safe farm from his carry or he will keep feeding. The second scenario where rotating to your safe lane is good is when you have a carry that can benefit from staying in the lane for longer periods. If your carry is someone like AM, Slark, Spectre or whoever benefits from staying in lane, then buying them an additional minute or two is good given that you can punish the enemy offlaner by killing him. Key point here is that you kill the enemy offlaner, otherwise it's better to rotate to the enemy safe lane. 
The next thing we will be going over is TP usage. TP usage on mid heroes isn't exactly the same as for carry heroes. Carry players utilize TP in a way that leads to more farm, whereas mid players utilize TP in a way that leads to more participation in fights. TP scroll has a cooldown of 80 seconds, meaning that once you use it, there's a window of 80 seconds where you can miss out on a lot of opportunities. For example, let's say you TP to your tier 1 after respawning or just like in general. Now the enemy knows that you don't have TP for 80 seconds, meaning that if the enemy decides to fire in some side lane, you have no way of helping your team. You basically are stuck. Unless you decide to walk to the side lane which is inefficient and has no guarantee of you reaching in time. When it comes to using TP as a mid laner, always think about this one thing. Is there any chance there will be a skirmish in the next two minute or two? If the answer is yes, walk to your tower or wherever you want to go instead of TPing. What this does is if a fight starts on a side lane, you will have your TP to join and help your team and turn the tide. Whereas if you waste your TP, you won't have any way to join the fights for the next 80 seconds. To keep it simple, before TPing, think about what consequences can it lead to and you will develop a better intuition. Unless you're a greedy mid laner, then you don't care about this. You basically use your TP to secure as much farm as you can get. Greedy mid laners don't participate in fights early on, so they focus on either farming or pressuring the enemy tier 1 every chance they get. Lastly, don't move around showing on the map without a TP scroll in your TP slot. That is the biggest blunder you can make. Let's move on to the post laning phase. The first thing you need to decide is whether you need to farm or create space for your team. In order to identify that, you need to look at what kind of hero you are playing. If you're playing a greedy hero, then by default, you should be farming because you're playing carry from the mid lane. If your carry hero is a hero that needs some time to be useful, something like AM, PA for example, both these heroes need at least 2 or 3 big items before they can do anything. Then you need to create space for them. For that, you need a hero with some combination of mobility, escape, wave clear, and the ability to scale with levels and not just gold. To keep it simple, if your carry is a greedy hero that needs items, then you have to create space for him. And if you are playing a greedy mid hero, then you are not required to create space for your carry. Farming is basically taking all the safe farm on the map, while creating space is playing the dangerous areas of the map so your carry can take the safer farm. Keep in mind, if your carry is a greedy hero, and you are also a greedy mid hero, you already fucked up quite frankly. Now the real question is, if we're creating space, how the fuck are we going to scale? You scale by taking the unsafe farm and by killing people. Space creators are popular on the mid lane because of their high mobility and escape mechanisms. These mechanisms let us farm and push waves in dangerous parts of the map. This allows us to take that farm that wouldn't be accessible to other members of the team, while simultaneously allowing our carry to take the safer farm. Dangerous areas of the map can be identified based on the enemy movements. Wherever the enemy is trying to play post cleaning phase is considered dangerous. Oftentimes, this is our own safe lane as farming there creates optimal farming patterns for the enemy. Since our carry wants to farm instead of fight in the early game, it's more efficient that our carry plays opposite to where the enemy is trying to play. Ideally, our carry doesn't want to play in unsafe area. As a mid laner, our job is to force the enemy towards us and away from our carry by playing in the opposite lane from our carry. When the enemy reacts to the pressure created by us, our carry safely farms because the map is fully open for our carry. If we're taking a safe farm on the map, we are griefing our carry by forcing him towards an unsafe area where he can end up dying or wasting his time. The next thing we will be focusing on is how to use smokes properly. There are two types of smokes, one is offensive smoke and the other is defensive smoke. The basic idea behind smokes is that you use them to get control of certain parts of the map or to delay the game of a free farming opponent. To decide whether you need an offensive smoke or a defensive smoke, look at the state of the game. Mainly look at how many farming areas you have on the map. Defensive smokes are used to take back your part of the area. For example, if there is a broodmother in your jungle, making it hard for your team to farm there, you should smoke there and kill the brood which will open that area of the map for you to farm at. Dota is all about resources. The more map you have, the more farm you and your team will be. Similarly, if you have farm or don't require any defensive smokes, you should look to use smoke offensively in a way that it leads to an objective or kills the enemy cores. 
For example, if you have the items required to fight, you should smoke towards an objective. In this case, let's take this fight as an example. They smoked here because Roche is up. As Dyer, you should smoke towards the enemy triangle. As Radiant, you should smoke towards the enemy outpost. If your smoke turns out to be successful, you can get Roche for free. A good tip is to always smoke to your vision or when you have when you smoke, ask your supports to keep an observer ward with them so they can put it during the fight and give you vision advantage. If there's a hero with a big kill streak or the enemy carry who's free farming, you should smoke towards that hero and get the gold from the kill streak or delay the farm of their farming core. In my opinion, this should only be done if you don't require any defensive smokes. Remember, use your smokes in a way that you get some form of map advantage. How to decide whether to farm or to fight? In order to understand whether you need to fight at a particular point or to farm, take a particular hero, in this case Puck, as an example, and ask yourself these three questions. Question number one, what is my hero good at? In this case, Puck is an elusive hero that likes to do magical damage without being caught. Question number two, what is my hero bad at? When you think about it, if Puck is an elusive hero, what would counter her? Spells or heroes being able to catch Puck like silences, targeted stuns, hexes, etc. Basically stuff that doesn't allow Puck to move freely. Question number 3. How do I fix the weakness of my hero? We have determined that the weakness of Puck is his inability to be elusive. In simpler words, him being caught because of spells or items. Now that we have asked ourselves these questions, the answer to whether to fight or farm is simple. If the enemy has heroes that counter the way our hero likes to play, in this case, if the enemy has spells or items that can catch Puck, he can't participate in fights until he gets something for the spells or items, like Lincolns or Yules in this case. Puck is required to farm his items and then participate in fights. There are ways around it, like waiting for these spells or items to be used, then entering these fights or killing the targets that possess these spells or items. For example, if you're playing as Lion as a Puck, you can initiate on him with your silence and you your issue in fights would be gone. But in most cases, itemization is an easier alternative. There's also something that I didn't mention in the farming section earlier that I think would fit here. Farming as mid isn't just by taking unsafe farm and kills. There's a rubber band effect in play. Rubber band effect here means that there will be a time you will shift rules with your position 1, meaning that you will be taking the safe farm from the map. The basic idea is that, let's say you are in the farming phase because you need items to be useful in the mid game and your carry has the items to be able to take unsafe farm. In this case, you should take safe farm from the map. The second thing is a very simple piece of advice, take any farm that you can without dying from the map where your carry can't reach or won't farm. This is your key to becoming a wraith boss by farming. You need to know when it is your time to farm. Moving on to itemizing as a mid. In order to itemize properly, the first thing that you need to do is to have a basic idea of the default build for your hero. Default build is the usual itemization on a hero. For example, on Puck, people always buy Witchblade, Blink, Kaya Sange, Octarine. For Ember, people always buy Maelstorm, PKB, Kaya Sange, Aghanim. These are the default builds for heroes. To have a better idea about this, go to duel2protracker.com, search for your hero, and you can figure out what the default build is for your hero. Once that is figured out, you need to ask yourself these three questions. I won't go deep into it as I've already made an in-depth video about itemizing as a myth, which will appear on the top right if you are interested. The three questions that you need to ask yourself are, question number one, what does my hero excel at? You need to think for a second about the hero you are playing. What is the part about your hero that makes it a strong hero? Your goals in terms of itemization is to make sure your itemization allows your hero to do the stuff your hero is good at. Question number two, what stops my hero from doing what it likes to do? Now, you have to think about some general things that stop your hero from excelling. Question number three, how do I overcome all of these issues? In order to overcome the issues that disrupt the ideal game for our hero, we need to itemize in a way that progresses our game towards ideality. This thought process will help you in itemizing any hero in any particular role as well. Another thing that makes a mid player great is knowing how to teamfight properly. When it comes to teamfights, target priority is the most crucial thing. How do you decide which target you want to go on? In order to know that, you need to once again ask yourself the questions that you ask yourself in the, in the when to fight and when to farm part because it is correlated. Let's take Puck as an example. Question number one, what is my hero good at? 
In this case, Puck is an elusive hero that likes to go in and out of fights, doing tons of magical damage, silencing and catching foes without being caught. Question number 2. What is my hero bad at? When you think about it, if Puck is good at being elusive and doing magical damage, what is she bad against? Things that don't allow him to be elusive and do constant magical damage. Basically, disables, silences, mutes, and spell immunity. Question number 3. How do I fix the weakness of my hero? One way to fix this is by buying items that help against disables and mutes. Since Puck is a hero that likes to go in and out and likes to play long fights, meaning that BKB would be useless on him. BKB is usually good on heroes that want to hard commit. Puck is a hero that doesn't like to hard commit, he likes to be annoying in fights. So if BKB is bad, what other items can allow him to counter these things? If you look at Puck's kit, his face shifts allows him to dodge a lot of projectile stuff, and most of the target spells can be countered by Lincoln or other items like Kaya Sange for example. Basically, you need a combination of items and gameplay when it comes to team fighting. In mid game, most heroes have BKB and Puck's entire kit is countered by BKBs. If you think about it, what heroes do not have BKBs in mid game? Supports. Not just Puck. Most mid laners lose their impact as spellcasters after the enemy gets BKBs, so their target supports in every fight, going on the backline and getting rid of their spells. Another way to fight is to aim the heroes that counter the way you like to play. If you go on them first with your silence and manage to kill them, the rest of the fight will be free for you. The basic idea is that you want to have as much impact as you can in the fight, and in order to do that, you need to remove the factors that decrease your impact. Keeping in mind what we've discussed before, we can conclude that going on heroes without BKB is an impactful move. Going on the backline supports is a good move, and killing heroes that counter the way we play before they can kill us is also a good move. Moving on to closing out games and high ground discipline. I'll keep this very short as the video is already omega long. To keep it simple, don't rush to the enemy high ground or objectives unless you are sure there are no risks involved. If you have the advantage, instead of rushing and throwing it away, increase the advantage by farming the entire map and increasing your net worth. As a mid laner, if you have travels, you can split push lanes, not allowing the enemy to go out from their base. Eventually, you will have so many items that the risk will be non-existent. Not only that, the enemy will make a mistake because of impatience. High ground is basically discipline. Be super disciplined if you don't want to throw games on the high ground. If you want a deeper analysis on this part, you can look at the high ground part in my carry guide. The last thing I will be covering in this guy is mentality. When it comes to Dota, mental game carries you further than skill does. I want you to know that as a mid player, you have the capability to solo carry your games. So dwelling on your teammates is pointless. If you're in a difficult lane, mentally prepare yourself to not focus on winning the lane, but instead focus on not losing the lane. This means that you go into the lane with the mindset that you want to get whatever you can get from this lane without feeding. If you're in a difficult game, understand that if you have developed good mid lane fundamentals, you can still win your games. Don't get pressured into doing stuff that you don't believe is correct. Follow the teachings in the guide religiously and you'll come out ahead in seemingly unwinnable games. Remember, flaming your teammates isn't going to make them play better. Instead, it will make the game worse. Take a break if you lose multiple games in a row. Most of the time, your brain is so tilted it stops you from performing how you normally would. Lastly, remember to follow this guide gradually. Take things slow and work on one aspect at a time so you don't feel overwhelmed. I hope this guide was helpful. If you are interested in private coaching, you can join my Discord linked in the description. Other than that, I've also linked my Patreon where you can find excellent investment opportunities in terms of coaching packages. If you like the content, do subscribe as this will encourage me to make more videos like this. Do let me know in the comments if you have any feedback. Have a nice day and good luck with your games.